Wednesday, August the 15th, 2018, in the Edison Room. Thank you for your attendance and good morning. So, I'm trying to follow Dr. Powell's excellent leadership, starting on time, and going right into the uh, agenda. So, first thing, do we have a quorum? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, Talley, any, any uh, introductions? Thank you, Chairman, Chairman Hilton. And we do have a couple of introductions. Of course, the new employees this morning. Uh, they are both Air Pollution Control District uh, QC Techs. And we have D Domain Jean and Brian Powers. And I'm uh, uh, very happy to have both of them. They are up in our, our monitoring section. And uh, Billy, who is not here, is at a conference today, but getting very close to being fully staffed for the first time in a long time. <laughs> uh, just really happy to have both of them on board. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, any uh, public recognitions. No public recognitions. Except, I, I, I take that back. We do have in our presence our prior chair. And attendance to the audience this morning. Yes. We're good to have him. 28 years he uh, served on the operation. Twenty eight years in a day. Yeah, so mm -hmm. good to have you. Uh, approval of minutes. I'm sure everyone has received the uh, published uh, uh, minutes. Are there any uh, uh, updates or directions to the minutes? If not, can I get a second to uh, approve the uh, minutes? It's probably moved in second that we uh, uh, accept the minutes as published. Now we're ready to vote. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as published and distributed, that we know by saying aye. Hold. Minutes are approved. Thank you. And I want to uh, also thank the uh, secretary because this is probably the third straight month that we've had the minutes published without any uh, corrections. That's great. Thank you. Uh, are there any? Uh, Public uh, comment of uh, Mrs. Hamilton. Yes, good morning. We wanted to let the board know that we received a call from a citizen who would be unable to attend the meeting today. So they have submitted a comment with respect to whiskey fungus in writing. And a copy of that comment has been uh, provided to you this morning and will be made a part of the record of the minutes of the meeting.
all those types of web webinars and training that they make available to us. I want to point out to the board that we had, uh, I think it was our, it was our third workshop, our third workshop. Uh, and so actually we've had two since the last board meeting. Uh, we had the air quality and health uh, workshop reducing air pollution impact. And then this most recent one, we had orders reporting and responding. Uh, at that meeting, we also had representatives from MSD, Health and Wellness, and EMA uh, available at that meeting to make presentations. And, and I'm really, I think I pointed it out last time, and, and I, I need to do it again. The staff is just doing an incredibly good job of, of the presentation. I think we're presenting information that is important to the public, and I think we're doing it in a way that is very digestible. Uh, you know, the only thing I would, I would want more from these would be uh, more public participation. Uh, but we're not daunted by that because we see this as an opportunity, one, to hone these presentations, and our hope then is that the word gets out and folks talk about them, that we just get to take these individual presentations on topics that are of interest to different community groups, different sectors in our community, and go out and just do those presentations for those groups. So. Uh, even even when, with the low turnout, there's great benefit to, to these, uh, and uh, I, hopefully we will have the opportunity to, to go out and do these in the community, uh, and improve our engagement, and give the community what they really have asked for, which is an opportunity to sit down with us and to discuss particular issues uh, and have some very informal conversation uh, back and forth about those. So uh, we have four more uh, workshops Maine. Uh, I encourage uh, anyone on the board and then anyone in the audience to attend these uh, coming up. And I don't have my card here, or I'd read the ones that are coming up. Do you have? The next one is APC's regulatory process. So we'll be talking about um, basically our work from rulemaking and regulation, um, which we do on the board's work as well, um, through permitting, compliance, and enforcement, and we're um, highlighting within those processes all the points in which there's public participation opportunities. And um, one of the goals that we have is to help the attendees of the workshop and those who may do this later um, have a better familiarity with the processes, know those points of participation, and uh, be more empowered to um, make comments during our process and you know, feel like they, they have that opportunity. Um, these workshops, as people pointed out, are for informal conversations Uh, to make it a, a better product out there for the community. So 
So my hope is for it to, to, to grow and uh, there will be a lot more impact going forward. Yeah. Um, we also had the opportunity, uh, certain members who are involved, uh, take part in this to do uh, some metro training with equitable purchasing training. And it, and it really is basically Metro's opportunity not to do more than just make sure there's an opportunity for diversity in terms of the purchasing that Metro does, but to be more proactive uh, and help facilitate that diversity. And so there was a training that was put on down at the Mirrors Gallery. Uh, uh, personnel that were involved in the purchasing process were asked to attend, and they, they are taken very seriously. Uh, Metro's push to make sure uh, that Everybody in this community has the opportunity to participate uh, in the economic side of what Metro government does. And so I just want to make the board aware that we did attend that, that meeting and, and we will look for opportunities, uh, hopefully as well as the rest of the agency in Metro government. All right. So unless there are any questions, I will introduce the presentations that they come up. Any questions from board members? So we're happy today to uh, have with us members of uh, Metro uh, Public Health and Wellness. Uh, we have Rebecca Holland back on uh, the schedule, uh, but there have been some changes, and so we have some different personnel. Uh, we have T. Gonzalez and Nick Park making presentations this morning. I'll allow them to introduce themselves and, and to give their titles, and very happy to have their report this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is T. Gonzalez, and I um, am, the, am the interim director over at the Center for Health Equity, which is a part of our uh, Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness. Um, and I'll let my colleague introduce himself. My name is Nick Hart. I'm an environmental health manager with the uh, Environmental Health Division at the Health Department. Um, I'm also a team member of the Environmental Quality and Cause Team in the Health Department's initiative to address health equity. I think it was appropriate key mission and equitable spending uh, because his description that the helping facilitate bringing it to the community, making awareness of equity in the community in different ways we can all help and put our hands into making sure that not only we're achieving health equity, but we're achieving equity across the dimension. So like I said, we're uh, from the um, from the Center for Health Equity. Um, the Center for Health Equity was established in 2006 by Dr. Awale Truman, who was the department's uh, director at the time. Um, so we are working to uh, advance health equity across our community. We'll talk a little bit about what that is. I'm the same one. So a little bit about our vision over at over at the center, right? We want a Louisville where every person in every community can enjoy hope, happiness, and wellness. Uh, so that's the, the the vision set before us. We know it's a big task. Um, I think that we can talk, you know, talking about hope and happiness and wellness. Um, we have we have uh, our work cut out for us here in Louisville, um, but we think that this is something that we can be working towards every single day. Um, we can do that through public health um, and doing that in partnership with ABCD and you all as a board. Um, we know that this is something that we can be working towards and make great progress towards our vision. So what is health equity? It's important to talk about the differences when we, a lot of folks are familiar with the word equality, um, but here we're talking about equity, so we want to be clear about what we mean by that, okay? So what's health equity? Well, in Louisville, we want that to be where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy and reach their full human potential. So how is this different than equality, right? When we're talking about inequalities, um, we're really talking about um, some things that all of us can understand, which when we're talking about health inequalities, things that are, um, that all of us can understand, such as uh, you can understand the differences in maybe like talking about physical mobility for say folks who are older adults as the folks who are gen you know younger folks, right? We understand that there's some differences in physical mobility, right? So those are inequalities, but we expect those to happen. Those are just part of life, okay? But when we're talking about inequalities, right? We're talking about things that are not natural um, and things that are not inevitable. Okay, so we're talking about things that, we're really talking about opportunity here. We're talking about 
equity, it's important for us to try to hear opportunity. Okay, so what we're talking about is the opportunity for everyone to reach their full human potential, to have the greatest opportunity to be as healthy as they possibly can be. Okay, so that's what we're going to keep in mind when we're thinking about equity. So today we're talking about our 2017 Health Equity Report. This is our third such Health Equity Report. Um, and all of these reports are building on each other, but this one has some new uh, components to it that we haven't previously had in other reports. So we'll talk a little bit about that now. So what's new in our report? If you're familiar with our 2011 or 2014 report, you're going to notice that we have some different map boundaries in this 2017 report. Um, so our previous reports were based off of uh, the 2000 uh, uh, census tracts, okay? Um, now we're gonna change those boundaries a little bit to uh, the census tracts mirroring those from the 2010 census, as well as we're gonna make some map boundaries here that are called market areas. And we've done that for a couple of reasons, but mostly because um, to align with our uh, city's comprehensive plan, or the 2040 comprehensive plan that's being completed, that has been completed, we want to make sure that the information we're presenting here um, for our red for you and our residents across the community, um, as you're reading this information, you're able to match that up against other metro reports, including this comprehensive plan. So when we're thinking about strategies, when we're thinking about uh, possible solutions to implement. Uh, folks can be able to look at these comparable uh, maps and uh, geographic distribution to understand what are some best uh, practices and best uh, opportunities to move forward and enact change. Okay, so you'll notice that difference. Um, additionally, I'll say that I've helped to work on each of our health equity reports. Um, I'm happy to see that this time we're including um, the full life course perspective. Um, you know, one of the things I'll say that we've improved on this time is being able to include health outcomes all the way from infancy uh, to, the, to later on in older adulthood, okay? Um, so you'll see some new health outcomes. We'll talk about infant mortality as well, well as talking about Alzheimer's disease. So across the full spectrum of life. Um, so that's a new change in our uh, report this time and really happy to see that because we know that we're having significant health outcomes at every stage of life uh, across our community. Uh, this next word, intersectionality, you may or may not have heard about it. This word, all it really means is this understanding that we each have uh, many identities that we're holding. So it might be, uh, yes, we have our gender, but we also have race. We also have our uh, economic standing. We have ability, uh, different levels of ability or different types of ability. When we say intersectionality, we want to understand that all of those identities to working, working together within an individual means that they're experiencing our society, our community uh, in different ways. Okay, so that really is important because as we um, look at what those differences might be, for different groups of people who have these identities. Um, it might reveal to us, one, that they, maybe if we're looking at the data, having certain health outcomes um, at different rates than other groups. Um, and then being able to look at that also means that we're able to identify, or we'll need to be able to identify different strategies or implement various solutions, targeted solutions uh, for those groups. So we want to take a look at that because different communities may have different needs. Um, if you're looking at our full report, you'll be able to see some different artwork that we've included this time. And finally, this last one here, this tree metaphor, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but you'll see this graphic design of the tree and the roots and the soil throughout our entire uh, report this time. And we're doing that in a way of trying to uh, best present this information in the most clear way possible. So let's talk a little bit about how the report is structured. Uh, you'll have an introduction and there we lay out clearly um, some recommendations. Uh, we'll talk clearly about why we have to do this work, uh, not just as a health department, but as an entire community. 
um, in order to be able to uh, advance health equity, in order to work together at many different levels. Uh, we'll clearly define that in the, the beginning of our report. Next, you'll see some information, demographic information about Louisville. Our community is changing, right? We're, we're having, uh, you know, more and more all the time, new immigrant populations, refugee populations, so the uh, demographics of our community is changing. And so when we're considering health strategies and uh, implementing different solutions, we're gonna have to consider uh, the changes that are happening across our community to be best responsive to the needs of our community. So a little bit of different demographic information there. Uh, next, we really do uh, a deep dive into the root causes of our health. Okay, so what are the factors that are driving our health outcomes like diabetes or arthritis or infant mortality? Okay, so we'll do some exploring on that. Again, you'll see uh, some similar health outcomes to ones before, but also some new ones. And finally, we want this report, the full report, which is available online at healthequityreport.com, uh, for it to be a tool for people to use, right? This isn't just information to say, hey, these are the health challenges facing our community. We want to make sure that this is a tool so you'll see evidence-based best practices included in our report so that uh, wherever you are in our community, you can pick this up and say, okay, here are a list of things that I can do in order to advance uh, health equity and improve the public health across my community. Every single person has an opportunity to do that with the various uh, best practices that, will be li that are listed there in the report. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, tree metaphor and how it's presented throughout the entire report. We cover 21 health outcomes in the report. Um, and when you're flipping through the report, you'll see that uh, in the leaves of the tree. Okay? So if we're thinking about a tree, maybe think about your favorite tree. I uh, went past one of those willows the other day and there was lots of stuff hanging down and so I was thinking about how cool that would be to have in your yard. Um, so if you're thinking about a tree, think about the leaves of those trees, right? We might be looking at uh, whether or not the tree, the leaves are full, the leaves are bare, the, maybe the leaves are changing color, right? This is kind of the thing that we pay attention to, okay? Um, and so when we're talking about, in our report, we're gonna relate this to our health outcomes. So often when we're thinking about health, we focus on the health outcomes, right? We focus on those things like diabetes and heart disease, stroke, again, our infant mortality, smoking rates, this type of thing, right? This is the thing that grabs our attention, the outcome, okay? But we know that our health in our community is not starting there. All right, so where do we think the, the health is starting here? If we're looking at this tree, where is the health of the tree starting? Sure, in the roots, right? So just like in this tree, when we're looking at our health outcomes, we've got to go to the roots of those, okay? So we call these uh, root causes. If you're a public health person, maybe you've heard of social determinants of health. Uh, we think it's probably easier to say root causes of health. So we want to look in the roots, right? So what are the roots in this case when we're talking about our health? In our community, that's things like transportation and education, income, right? Um, talking about our environmental quality, okay? And the built environment. All of these things are shaping our health outcomes. But we've taken this metaphor a little bit further here. Because we know that it's not just the root causes. It's not just those things like education and uh, food systems, income levels that are shaping our health outcomes. It's also how we experience those things, right? So actually the, the health of the roots, the quality of those roots are actually shaped by the soil as well, right? Um, the tree can't uh, have its full life, right, if the soil's bad. Okay, so we have to go into the soil. And then the soil, we're gonna call that our systems of power. So that's things like racism or sexism, right? The rest of those isms. Um, those things are actually shaping the conditions of the roots. 
right? We're also clear that every person, every person here, every person across our community is experiencing these root causes. Food systems, transportation, education, income, every single housing, every single person in our community is experiencing those. The question then has to be how they are experiencing those, okay? So is it in poor housing quality? Is it in exceptional educational quality, right? Low wages to very high wages and wealth levels, right? Every single person is experiencing those, but we have to ask how, and we have to understand then the ways in which that's impacting our health outcomes. So a little bit about um, understanding the ways these systems of power impact root causes. We could look at an example like redlining Louisville. Is anybody familiar with redlining Louisville? Yep. Who can tell me a little bit about what this project is about? Sure. Looking at um, historic uh, mortgage lending patterns and how that um, affected who was basically allowed to buy homes and own property to build wealth. Okay, perfect. I heard all of you heard that, right? But historic lending practices, she said, right? That dictated who was allowed to get a mortgage, purchase a home, build wealth across our community, not just in this community, of course, though, across the country, right? So when we're considering those root causes, the roots and how they interact with the soil, those systems of power, this redlining uh, history in our community is a good example of understanding the ways in which those kind of larger systems, thinking about racism and sexism, etc., the ways in which that shapes a reality for us. For our, for our current context, again, just like was said, that's going to shape who had the opportunity to build wealth, uh, to have certain housing, etc., and that's going to shape even our present day health outcomes. Okay? because of how generational wealth happens. All right, so when we're considering health equity, we also have to consider our history uh, in order to understand our present day context. Now I'm gonna let, yeah. All right, so we'll move actually into the kind of the, the meat and nuts and bolts of the report. See here, um, pretty much what we can see is our table of contents. You'll see all 21 health outcomes listed on the branch in front of you. But also this branch, uh, as mentioned by T before, presents this concept of the life force of health. All right? So I want to make sure everybody understands health doesn't happen in a vacuum. Right? We don't just experience poor housing at one time and then experience potentially uh, education at another time. We don't experience good health at one time and bad health at one time. It's throughout the course of our life. So this branch is representing this in two different ways. Number one, at different stages of our life, we are going to experience certain health outcomes at a higher rate. So for instance, you'll see here in youth, you have lead poisoning. That's just because children with um, developing systems absorb lead at a higher rate. They're gonna experience lead poisoning much higher rates than say an adult who has a developed system who actually doesn't need to bring in those nutrients into the body. So they're not actually displacing other nutrients with lead. Same versus um, arthritis towards the end of the branch, which is, you know, we can see is a lifetime of impact on the body. You're going to experience a lifetime, excuse me, you're going to experience arthritis at that time in your life. The next thing that this presents is the fact that <coughs> our health at one point in our life is going to affect our health outcomes at a different point in our life. So the experiences that we have younger in life are going to experience our health, are going to influence our health outcomes. Uh, for instance, there have been a number of studies about children who are experiencing violence, and that result of violence is going to actually raise stress and anxiety levels later on in life leading to a greater rate or chance that, that person might experience things like strokes and heart disease. So we actually get into our first example of our map here. Um, we've chosen cancer. Uh, we choose cancer a lot when we're doing these presentations. Anybody have a guess why? Any indication? 
Cancer is the leading cause of death in the world. Right? Um, the leading cause of death throughout the United States is heart disease. Louisville has the same rate of heart disease as the rest of the United States, but we have an elevated rate of cancer. All right? Now I want to illustrate how we uh, presented some of our data here in the, and throughout our report. You'll see on the right, we have our map. This is a good indication of our market areas that T was talking about earlier, how we're presenting the data. You'll see to the far right of the map, we have um, a lower rate of cancer. And as we move to the west, we'll have higher, that cancer rate is increasing higher. Um, we also have um, an illustrated first on the top chart of cancer deaths versus cancer incidences. We know that not all people die from cancer, so we wanted to illustrate that both in two ways. And I'm not sure if you can see it here, but just on cancer, cancer deaths, uh, our male populations are pretty much beating out the female populations when it comes to cancer deaths. Black men are at the top, followed by white men. And then down here in the middle, we have cancer instances. We actually have this broken down into types of cancer. And then here at the bottom, you'll see where we've broken it down into both race and uh, sex. We try to do that throughout the report to show those intersectionalities. We try to break up this data to see as many identities as possible when we're talking about health outcomes. At the bottom, you'll see our first example of root causes that T spoke about earlier. Root causes are going to be attached to all of our health outcomes. Cancer, we've attached four different root causes. You'll see here that they're going to represent human health and services, employment and income, environmental quality, as well as food systems. So what we're saying here is that all of these root causes are going to contribute to those higher rates of cancer deaths or cancer incidences. Um, each one of the root causes has a description of how it contributes to that health outcome. Anybody want to offer a suggestion to potentially how one of these root causes could potentially contribute to cancer? I'm going to pick environmental quality if nobody else has how about smoking? <laughs> smoking. Smoking. Smoking, absolutely. Smoking is included here in environmental quality, particularly secondhand smoke, which is one of the leading, leading causes of cancer, next to actually radon for non smokers. Anybody else saw another hand back here? Uh, no, human services. People may not have access to health care or insurance or the other issues. Absolutely. People who do not have access to health care actually catch or as you now say, catch cancer, but are aware that they have cancer later on in their progressive stage. The later you catch the fact that you have cancer, the less opportunity you have to recover from cancer and continue to live a healthy life. Um, also, we have employment income. This goes to insurance. People who have higher employment income are able to afford preventative medicine, right? That's also what your job is. It's also going to dictate whether or not you're exposed to certain cancer-causing agents, whether or not you're working in agriculture or construction, manufacturing, or any kind of service industries, you have those different exposures. Obviously, we're sitting here in a nice you know, air-conditioned building. I imagine that we're getting bombarded by a few fewer cancer-causing agents than someone who's, say, working in a truck yard inhaling diesel fumes all day. All right, so moving on. So, talked about root causes, now we're going to talk about best practices and evidence-based uh, uh, solutions to the potential root causes. So here, I do want to take a, a time to just stop, look back at the map, just because I want to make sure everybody understands that this data is our community. This data is individuals, all right? So when we look at cancer deaths, when we look at cancer instances, these are people that we interact with on a regular day, whether we go to uh, play sports with them, go to church with them, work with them. These are real people. So we looked at the solutions. That was their number one ask of us. Fine, we know what our cancer rates are. Now what do we do about it, all right? And so the strategy that we've chosen is what people might recognize as the social, social ecological model. We at the health department call this the levels of society. I think this is, a, excuse me, is particularly appropriate when we talk about solutions because it helped me the best when I first was introduced to the report to understand systems of power. All right, T talked earlier, it's the systems of power that influence how root causes, how we experience root causes, all right? So we talk about, you know, why would I choose to have a job that you know, uh, exposes me to diesel emissions all the time? I mean, I have that choice to choose otherwise because of my income, because of my education, because of my housing. 
So when I think about systems of power, I think of systems of power through our solution model. Uh, we talk about racism. is a big one that we all need to be aware of. There's individual racism. There's interpersonal racism. Groups, when we get up here, community and organizational racism, that's what redlining is about. Redlining was a national policy to not loan to racial groups or cultural groups based on, they want to say, their location, but it really was a self-prophesizing kind of activity. They went into a community, found racial minorities, found a black community, found an immigrant community, and said, this is not a community that's worth loaning to. So you didn't loan to that. And if you remember our map earlier, we had the map of income. So we get into those areas that were not allowed loans, we get into our poor communities. So we look at our best practices and our evidence-based solutions. We want to make sure that to have the highest impact, we have interventions at every single level. The further we get up the, the, the levels of society, the bigger impacts we're going to have. If we look at each health outcome, we're going to see our best practices for solutions. All right? You'll see down here at the individual level, all the way up the policy making level. They also correspond with our root causes. You'll see human health services up at the top, environmental at the top, food access, all the way down here to what can we individually do? Support people who are going through cancer treatment. Help people quit smoking down here, all right? But up here at the top, we have a policy solution, particularly under environmental health, which was mentioned earlier about smoking. What has the city done to reduce cancer incidences? We've implemented uh, a smoke-free ordinance, not only just for tobacco smokers, but also the smokers, as well as vaping. No smoking indoors, no smoking near entrances to buildings, all right? This is where we get the biggest bang for our buck. We want to see interventions at every single level. So, throughout all these best practices, <laughs> our report does suggest a couple of key recommendations you'll see here. Create interventions at the root cause level. Um, have interventions at every level of our levels of society. And then one of them here we want to uh, particularly highlight is improve our data collection system. If we don't have data on every single and until we have that data, we don't actually know what solutions to offer to resolve potential health outcomes based on those root causes or even the equity, the, excuse me, the equity issues that we're seeing with those root causes. So what's being done? At the health department, we've actually changed our mission to focus around health equity. You'll see here, to achieve health equity and improve the health and well-being of all rural residents and visitors. This is a tool, like T said earlier. We want this to be a roadmap for other agencies, for other organizations, for individuals about what we're going to do to address these outcomes. Mm. Particularly, uh, the health department has realigned and created focus groups within some of our primary root causes. And I say primary, some of our root causes we think we might be able to meet the biggest bang for our fund. Um, each one of these groups is made up of multiple individuals in the health department. They could be environmentalists, uh, data analysis, uh, performance improvement, and we created each one around each one of these root cause teams. With each one of those root cause teams, we're focusing on each individual's assigned a skill group, whether it be policy development, community engagement, strategic partnership, and data analysis. We plan at the end of this for each one of the, our root cause teams to, to produce and come out with a plan of action. What is the health department going to do? How are we going to bring people into our community, to our organization? be able to address equity and root causes of health outcomes. And so that's where I come to the end of this. What can you do to advance health equity? Everybody's got to work together. We've all got to recognize these problems exist. And we've got to pull our collective efforts to move this issue forward. If you want more information about uh, the health equity report or request one, I think we might have actually brought some health equity reports um, for the board and for HPCB. Uh, but if not, you can go to healthequityreport.com. So, anybody have any questions? I'm not sure how far uh, we advanced in this, but I will check the time. 23 minutes. That's pretty good. Questions? All right. Any other information? Please visit us, visit us online.
board meetings and government. So uh, we have an opportunity to do this in person, the press office, commission train. We kind of looked at it outside of our, our own little bubble of metro rural, but to some of our first cities and then even uh, regionally and nationally, just to kind of see uh, how it's going across the country and how we fit into that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Region. Um, before I get started, I want to mention that I took a bit of a bit, bit of a deeper dive. Uh, I was actually out last month and would have given that then. Uh, it's actually fortuitous that it comes this month instead because a lot of this does fit in with uh, what uh, T and Nick just talked about. Uh, it is one of those root causes as far as cancer in particular. Um, and the question, uh, as Mr. Kelly mentioned, really came from uh, June when we, uh, Ms. Hamilton was giving a presentation on. Uh, STAR and the update, uh, our progress under STAR. Uh, and this slide shows Category 1 toxic air contaminant emissions in Louisville for 2016. Uh, category 1 TAC emissions are those that were judged to be the, um, the greatest drivers of risk in West Louisville, in particular during the West Louisville Air Toxic Study in the early 2000s. By definition, these are the ones that were found to cause a cancer risk of greater than one in a million or a uh, hazard quotient for non-cancer risks of greater than one. Um, and Dr. Coburn uh, asked a question that uh, I personally, I think several others sort of kicked ourselves for not having asked before. Given that uh, Louisville's air quality trends really uh, follow the pattern of national trends and regional trends, uh, as far as PM on the bottom there and ozone, um, I'd like to point out we do meet the national trend on ozone. I'm really happy to find that when I put this slide together. Um, what does our trend in your toxics, and specifically Category 1 tax, look like compared to that, uh, that national and regional trend? Nationally, from 2000 to 2016, over that same period, you see that, that green line uh, is the national percent change in emissions of those uh, air contaminants. And while we see a bigger drop in the early 2000s, after STAR, we see that we not only fought out, but we beat the national trend. The national trend was about an 80% reduction over that period of time. In Louisville, we saw a 98% reduction in those pollutants. Um, and before I go further, I want to point out Dr. Coburn, who wisely asked about actual concentrations in the air. We don't have that data locally or nationally for that period, so we can't really answer that. We are now beginning to, uh, as we stated, a number of board meetings, collect data at our firearms training site on a number of these pollutants. Um, it's not common, but it's becoming more common in other urban areas as well as we implement the uh, photochemical assessment monitoring systems, the PAMS monitors that are required. Um, also, uh, as far as our comparison to other counties, in 2000, you'll see that for these, Toxic air contaminants, we were 11th in the country uh, in emissions. Um, considering our population compared to some of the other places, uh, that's kind of high. But by 2016, we had dropped to 153rd in the country uh, as far as emissions of these contaminants. Just below uh, Hamilton, that's Cincinnati, Ohio. I'd just love to point out when we meet somebody. Uh, and you asked specifically about a number of cities. Uh, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, St. Louis, um, I also tossed in Birmingham, Chattanooga, Memphis, Nashville, and Pittsburgh, uh, just to see where we fit into a number of cities that we are often compared to for peer cities. And that's where we were and where we are. You'll see that in 2000, and this is not percent change, this is absolute number of pounds of emissions, we were significantly higher than any of those cities. Uh, but by 2016, we not only caught up, but we are the third lowest. Only Chattanooga and Nashville are the lowest there. Um, and I also went all the way back to the beginning of the TRI. Uh, it actually goes all the way back to 1987. You'll see that it wasn't always thus. Uh, we started off really sort of in parity with many of these um, peer cities, but even though we saw reductions, we didn't see reductions at the rate that many of them did. Uh, we sort of held out a bit longer and took a little bit further dive into why that is, and as I said, I hope to be able to give a little bit more information at a future meeting. Um, but this also uh, had a real impact citywide. Um, this is comparison of the National Air Toxics Assessment Model Cancer Risk. 
This is modeling that EPA does periodically. Um, and this is the cancer risk in 2005 on the left and 2011 on the right for point sources of air toxins. These are the um, industries that report to TRI primarily. Um, and you'll see we have a one in a million reduction citywide. Um, and this doesn't look like a lot, but it's actually a 30% reduction in cancer risk. And a really important point here is that in 2005, they had not determined that chlorine was a cancer risk. We accepted it as one here locally based on uh, assessments from other jurisdictions, but EPA did not consider chlorine a cancer risk yet. By 2011, they had. By my math, and I'm not great at math, <laughs> but by my math, if you add chlorine into that 2005, it would actually be 40 in a million uh, can uh, cancer risk citywide compared to just over two in a million. So we actually would have seen something more like a 94, 95% reduction in cancer risk citywide. Um, this has a real impact. Uh, we also have a number of other sources. This is the modeling. It's kind of hard to see up on the wall there, the colors. Um, and this is from all sources, not just point sources. Um, the background cancer risk is actually at 25 to 50 in a million. The national average is right around 40 in a million for everywhere in the country. Um, this slightly darker orange area that covers the most of Jefferson County is actually a risk of 50 to 75 in a million back in 2005. The inner core you see jumps up to 75 to 100 in a million, and that very center area actually jumps up over 100 in a million. In 2011, which is the last year that we have complete modeling from EPA for, uh, you still see that background everywhere, but that orange area has shrunk significantly to almost half the size, I guess, just by looking at it. Um, so that's that 25 in a million. We actually don't have anything over 50 in a million model risk anymore. Uh, so that's a huge change. Um, this is not uh, just a success story. Um, there's never truly a success story in air pollution control because there's always more to do. Um, things that we are keeping an eye on and we have seen progress on, but we would love to see more progress on. This is emissions of all tax, all four categories of tax, compared to those same set of cities. Uh, you'll see Louisville holding out at the top a little longer there. Uh, the past couple of years, we have seen a significant catch up that is um, largely attributable to reductions in sulfuric acid from LGA plants, that is a category two tax, uh, and a few other category two tax in particular, which are not carcinogenic, uh, but we still want to make sure that we keep an eye on those, make sure that we keep that trend going the right direction. Um, and one other thing, and this really ties in directly to what Nick and T presented earlier, is the disparity between minority and non-minority communities. Back in 2005, that difference in cancer risk was four in a million minority communities and non-minority communities. By 2011, it had been cut to 2.4 in a million, um, and that's a 43.6% reduction in that disparity, but non-minority communities are still at double the risk, or I'm sorry, minority communities are still at double the risk of non-minority communities for cancer from point sources of air toxins. Um, that's all I have. There are a number of resources available. These are primarily the places that I pulled most of this data from. Um, and at the discretion, I'd be glad to take any questions as well. So I'll turn it back over to Keith and Ms. Riddle. This, this will be up online. It's not yet. Well, uh, any questions of any board members or anybody else? If not, I'd like to thank uh, both presenters from the uh, Health Equity, and uh, we will reference the, uh, the website that I managed. Uh, seems like a pretty uh, detailed report, and it's always good to uh, the fact of how well we're doing around uh, health uh, issues in the world. And, uh, and it's uh, something that I think a lot of uh, people will be interested in uh, when they read this. And also, also, the fire against the, uh, the mission. That's interesting about the uh, comparison cities, how we compare to other cities. Louisville is really, uh, uh, we out of the realm for other uh, uh, cities, what we have done here in Louisville to make our cleaner uh, by looking at 
is something that parks the city. We, we, we've done quite a bit. If you look at our, our toxic inventory over the last uh, 10 years, uh, it has really uh, significantly uh, dropped. So uh, we're doing something right in the world. So I uh, appreciate the, the presentation and uh, uh, keep us uh, informed of uh, any other data. Do you have anything else? Well, the board does have the air quality uh, data report, the enforcement staff report, and the estimation report. We have to take any questions, no outstanding or major uh, issues to bring up. But if you have any questions, we have to address. No, I think uh, any board members have any uh, questions about our quality? Uh, do we have, uh, I think. Uh, uh, we've done very well. The fire no uh, other business to come before this board. I'm Terrence Peter until uh, Wednesday, September 19th. Thank you again for coming and invite friends and neighbors to come and share the information that they can get to these board meetings. Thank you.